Uh, I'm just going to talk about how we're making C Python faster. And when I say we, I don't just mean me or my team. I mean the whole uh, community over quite a few years. So the first thing is I've been thinking about this for a while. So uh, here's a picture of me at EuroPython. Was that 12 years ago uh, when I was uh, younger? Um, and yeah, so the first thing I want to talk about is everyone's all about speed, speed, speed. But I want to get you thinking about sort of terms of time. And the reason is in terms of like just simple maths, basically. So if you want to make something five times as fast, you need to reduce the execution time by 80%. Um, if you want to reduce it by 10 times as fast, you have to use it 90%. So you think, well, what's half as good as 10 times as fast? Well, it's five times as fast. Well, it isn't. Five times as fast requires almost as much work as 10 times as fast. As you can see from the picture, if you do half the work to get to 10 times as fast, you've got barely twice as fast. So. The other thing is we need to consider all aspects of the runtime. So if you, you know about uh, JavaScript, most of you, I imagine, most of us have heard of JavaScript, at least, even the most the hardcore Python programmer. And you might be aware you know, that the modern JavaScript engines are much, much faster than they used to be. And a lot of that is all uh, just-in-time compilers and other things. But there are many aspects to these programs. And if you just consider like part of the program and don't deal with all of the bits, then you have a bit of a problem. So imagine you've got you just ignore 10% of the program and focus on 90% and speed that up a lot. You think that would be good enough, but just ignoring that last 10% can really drag down your performance. The difference between just ignoring it completely and doubling its speed means that the effort you have to put into that 90% is reduced considerably. So saying we need to consider all aspects of the, the, the um, thing, we need to do some profiling and find out where the time is spent. If you can't read that diagram at the back, don't worry, I can't read it at the front either. It's more just to give you a feel for um, like how we profile. So these are all the sort of benchmarks in our standard benchmark suites broken down into sort of various aspects of the where time is spent. Um, the interpreter itself is a surprisingly small fraction of the time spent running a Python program. Something like this, these numbers are for 311. Uh, something like a third. And then we'd like memory management's 10%. The, the cycle GC, which is something you probably don't think about much, is 10%. And then there's library code and various dynamic lookups and various other bits and pieces. And we need to sort of consider all of these things. Because as I say, if we just consider like a third of the runtime, there's, we're not going to get much of a speed up. So there's a few general principles we like to sort of apply. And the, and the most important one is that nothing is faster than nothing. In other words, if you can replace anything you do by doing nothing, that's the best you can possibly do. So a lot of things are like, we just look for redundancy. You know, often the case, when I say do nothing, it's maybe don't do it repeatedly. So, you know, if you, if you do a lookup and then you do a lookup again, the second time you can get away without doing it at all. That's obviously as fast as it will go. There's speculation, which is basically making guesses about future behavior based on past behavior. Um, if you've gone round a loop a million times and you've seen the same types or every time, you're going to see the same types next time. And the last thing is sort of efficient data structures. That's how we lay out Python objects and various other sort of ancillary bits and pieces in memory. Um, that's more to do with just making it work well on modern hardware. Um, the CPU clock speeds compared with like main memory reads orders of hundreds of times faster. So fewer memory reads is always a, a good thing. So I'm going to go through those in reverse uh, order. So uh, sorry, I should say that. So I'll do some stuff on efficient data structures, then speculation. Uh, so shrinking the Python object. So let's consider a sort of simple Python object. So a Python object with four attributes. Just this code that doesn't do anything. It just exists. So we have an initializer, initializes the four attributes. And if we grab the dunder dict out of it, we'll get dictionaries showing those four attributes. This isn't really interesting. This is just a case of, like, this is just an example we can use as an archetype to show you how it's made out of memory. Now, if we go back to the olden days of uh, 2.7, 3.2, I don't know if there's anyone old enough here to have ever used anything earlier than 2.7. There is. There's a few hands going up, quite a few hands going up, actually. Anyway. But we, we'll try and forget about that. 
but it was a long time ago. But even, and, and to be honest, I don't think it made much difference before then. It was broadly the same. But this is how the object was laid out. I'm not going to worry about all the details, but I want to get you the sense that there's a lot of stuff there for just four attributes. And on a 64-bit machine, um, in the early days, a lot of those have been 32-bit machines, but on a 64-bit machine, that's 352 bytes. There's the object, the dictionary, and then all the ancillary stuff about keeping the, uh, all the data. Now, if you note the little bits, um, I hope everyone can see the highlighting there. So all the hashes and the keys there, if you have a 1,000 of objects of that I just showed you, all of the same class, then they all have the same hashes and keys in the, the dictionary table. So in 3.3, we started sharing those between the, the classes. So this they became looked like this. So now we just have a table with the values in it, and the keys are shared um, between all instances of the class. So the layout looks a bit like this. The reason I've just got green circles for the keys in the class is not that they're, they're, they're quite large objects, but they're shared. So if you have a 1,000 instances of the class, uh, then each kilobyte on the class itself only counts for one byte per object. So we're going to ignore those, pretend they're effectively zero. But there's still more redundancy here. You can see some gaps here in the values. And this is to do with hash tables and efficient lookup. So in 3.6, they were shrunk and they was removed. And we have what's called the uh, compact dictionary. Um, and then we have further refinements in three, uh, a little later. So if you can see, there's various alignment uh, aspects here. For, because C Python, as clear as in the name there, is written in C, we need compatibility with C libraries. And they insist on like two word alignments due to malloc restrictions. So anything that's an odd number of uh, words has to be aligned, and we waste a bit of space here. So you can see there's an alignment issue at the top, and one of the GC headers is wasted. So in 3.8, we shrink the GC header a little bit. GC is short for garbage collector. That's to do with this collecting cycles. And we're getting down to a more manageable size. So we're down to 160 bytes now from our original 352. But actually, there's a huge redundancy here. The entire dictionary. Um, it has no actual information. All the information in it is basically about the, uh, the table of values, which is in the table of values, and everything else is just saying, I'm a dictionary. As a, a GC header, so it can be garbage collected as a reference count, which just to say, because it exists, class pointer, which points to a dictionary, and then some other stuff that, again, is, is largely redundant. So in 3.11, we can just remove that altogether. And here we're down to a more reasonable memory use. Um, if you actually need the Dunder Dict in 3.11, we'll, uh, we'll dynamically recreate it, um, which can be a little efficient if you do use it heavily, although we're looking in 3.13 to, to dynamically re-remove it again if you do require it. There's a little bit more redundancy here. The, our dictionary pointer uh, is not necessary because we're not, I don't have a dictionary, so we can merge that with the values pointer. There's a little bit of alignment in the bottom. So in 3.12, we further shrink this to 96 bytes. Now, this is looking pretty good, but it's still not as good as like a C++ or Java class layout, but we're not too, doing too badly. Uh, but there's still a bit more redundancy. We probably don't need two words of GC headers. They're weak refs. Almost all objects don't have weak references, so we could maybe put that in flags and or an external table. So this is what the future might look like. Um, this won't happen in 3.13, but something akin to this might be in 3.14, we'll see. Uh, and this is where we put the values at the end of the object. This is less to do with space saving, say, space saving and more to do with the time it requires to look things up. So we can basically get to those values for a single hop from the pointer to the object. And as I said earlier, memory reads are key for performance. So skipping the one memory read will help us with performance. So over the last, I don't know, 10 years, I guess, when I, anyone know when 3.2 came out? <laughs> it was a while ago. Um, we've reduced the size by 77% and reduced the number of memory reads to access by 80%, at least the future version. Currently, the numbers aren't quite so good. And if you look at those, they don't compare too badly to uh, Java or C++. Uh, Java or C++, um, there's a little, being a little 
cheating here. When I say there's one memory read, the Java or C++ just requires that memory read, whereas Python, we need some additional checks to make sure that other things haven't changed. So there's a couple of um, additional checks to ensure that we're actually, like, we can use that fast path. But still, with modern CPUs, which can do several things at once, so we're still, it's in the order, in the same order as Java and C++, potentially. And the memory use is double, but I think, given the flexibility and, and power of Python, I think that's a reasonable price to pay. So having gone through how we've shrunk things, that was mostly focused on the past. Now I'm going to talk about speeding up the interpreter, which is probably more focused on the future. So as I said, the interpreter is a, a reasonable chunk of the runtime. It's definitely not all of it, and there's definitely more things we need to do around that, but obviously I won't have time to cover those in this talk. But I will focus on how we sped up the interpreter. So a little interlude before we do that. There's a thing called bytecode. I don't know how many people are familiar with bytecode. Can I have a sh quick show of hands? Some, some doing that, some people keeping their hands down. So I'll give you a very quick interlude. So, so imagine the very simple statement, y equals x. Uh, CPython, the virtual machine, is a stack machine. That means it operates by pushing values onto a stack and popping them off a stack. How that's implemented is not really relevant here. But the point is that the instructions that the VM operates operate on that stack. So to assign uh, x to y, we first have to load the value of x onto the stack, and then we have to store the value that's on top of the stack into y. And the bytecodes, which are the, machine, the virtual machine instructions that do that, are on the right here. So there's load fast and then store fast. So we load, it's just called, the reason it's called fast is because it's faster than the previous version. It's calling anything fast is always a terrible name because then you have like load faster and then load faster too and so on. So, uh, so these are just for loading local variables. So it could probably be better named load local. So anyway, load fast x, which takes the value x onto the stack, and then load store fast, puts it, the value on top of the stack y. To do the, uh, evaluate the expression a plus b, we do something similar. We load a and then we load b, and then we add them together. We're using this binary op, the short for binary operator instruction, and then this is the addition variant. And that leaves the addition A plus B on the stack. If we were to then store that to a local variable, we'd add a store fast to it. So that gives you a very simple version of bytecode, and hopefully the rest of this won't be too confusing if you've not seen bytecode before. So the bytecode's been fairly uh, straightforward, and we've not really messed with it um, it's just sort of added to as new features have been added up until quite recently. In 3.7, we made some small change to uh, improve method calls. Now, the thing with a method call in Python is that object.meth call, uh, parentheses, arg, is equivalent to assigning object.meth to a temporary variable and then calling the temporary variable with arg. And that temporary variable would be a, what's called a bound method. So up until 3.7, we actually created these bound methods every method call. In 3.7, we added this uh, instruction pair, a load method call method, which meant that we could avoid creating this temporary object on every method call. And then in 3.8, we added some caches to looking up lo uh, global variables. So every time you have like int or float or type or um, yeah, any, any sort of built-in function or type appears in your source code, that's obviously a name lookup, and in 3.8 we added some caches to those to speed those up. So there were fairly small improvements. Um, in 3.11, however, we made some pretty big and changes to these things. What's called the specializing adaptive interpreter. Um, and what that does is it specializes one bytecode at a time. So specializing is basically changing the bytecode so it's expecting a certain type or types. Uh, it's a very narrow overhead, but it does reduce a lot of the dynamic overhead. Uh, it's very narrow scope, but it reduces the dynamic overhead a lot. And the reason is that every time we see an addition, we don't have to do a lookup on the left type, and then if that fails, do a lookup on the right type, and do lots of uh, chasing around. We can just say, okay, we're expecting a couple of integers, we'll just check their integers, and then we'll do the simple integer addition. 
So the way this, as I said, works is we, we uh, specialize one bytecode at a time, and the, each bytecode is done independently. We don't try any sort of broader or more intelligent approach. Um, this makes it very simple and also pretty robust. And here's a couple of examples. So as I said, if we, we can specialize binary op into binary op add int, and that's specialized, obviously, for adding integers. We know statically there's going to be addition, because that was in the source code, but we dynamically we don't know the types. But again, it's one of those things where if the last time we executed that bytecode it was integers we're adding together, it will be integers the next time. Um, it's not guaranteed, obviously, so we need checks. But those checks almost never fail. Um, and consequently, it's a much, much cheaper to do a couple of cheap checks and then the exact operation we want to do than going all doing all the lookup. And this, this specialization here is uh, responsible for pretty much most of the speed up in uh, 3.11. And 3.11, we saw varying speed ups. But if you go back to the diagram which showed how the different programs spend different times in different parts of the program, I would say that 3.11 roughly sped up the actual interpreter itself. It doubled the speed of it approximately. It's very approximate. But obviously, you don't see that double speed up. You do for a handful of benchmarks, but generally you don't because programs don't always spend that much time in the interpreter itself. Another example is load attribute here, which is just loading an attribute of something. And a very simple specialization is load attribute class, which is where we're looking up on the class we know that the object we're looking up the attribute on is a class, and then we can do a, a, a different lookup. In fact, we can say, well, we know it's a class. We check which class it is because it's almost certainly the same as it was last time. And then we can actually just cache the result. Um, if you're interested in this, and it's all pretty interesting stuff, well, in my opinion anyway, uh, you can watch online Brand Bush's talk from PyCon US, and he explains this very well. It's a full half hour talk on this bit, which I'm trying to condense into two slides, and thus rather skimming over. So what I want to focus on more is about the future here. So that was a present. In the future, we want to optimize larger regions. So here's a couple of examples. We've got a little function add, and a tiny code snippet which adds b to 1. Now, uh, there's quite a lot of code. The byte codes are on the right. I'm not really expecting you to understand that too clearly. But basically, we have the function, and then below that, the little code that calls that function and stores the result. So what we can do is we can look at larger regions of code. So here's the thing where we effectively inline the function. You'll note that I've changed, you may note that I've changed the call to a push frame and the return to a pop frame, because we're no longer doing a call and um, return lookup. We're just skipping through that, because we can effectively inline the function. And this allows us to do both specialization, which is kind of what we were doing for the, um, the binary op add in, but we're going to break this down into smaller checks. So we check that the top and first item and the second item on the stack are integers, and then we add them in the highlighted section there. And then what we can do is called, what's called partial evaluation. Now, I'm, really, I'm just going to basically just hand wave this sort of way and give you a rough feel for what it can do. Uh, if you're really interested, there is a 400-page textbook online about partial evaluation. You have to be really interested for that. But it, I'll try to give you a rough feel for what we can do. But the idea is we can evaluate whatever we can up front, like during our sort of optimization phase, so we don't have to recompute it later. And we use a technique called abstract interpretation to do this. So I'm just going to basically just sort of uh, animate through this, manually animate it. So, so here's the code on the left. On the right at the bottom is the actual real frame, the actual in memory that we can, uh, the actual work that's done will be done at runtime. And the, the grayed out bit is the sort of abstract bit, which we're sort of abstractly interpreting. So as we go through the bytecode, we abstractly do what it says. So we load global, that pushes the function add into our abstract frame. We check as a function add, which is abstract, so we can kind of just not do the check. We have to do a little check somewhere else, but again, okay, I'll go to that, skip through that. Then we load the variable. We don't really need to load the variable. We just maintain abstractly what it would have been if we'd done it. Likewise, and then we push this frame, so we have another abstract frame. And we keep doing this until we get to a point where we actually need to do some work. So I, the previous one, 
we're checking that the value one is an integer. Well, we obviously, we don't need to do anything that. We know it is. But then here, we need to check that the value b is an integer. And in this case, we actually have to do some real work to do this. So first of all, we need to get the b. So here, we've, uh, if you notice, the, I've changed the color and slightly highlighted the load fast instruction there at the top. And that's because we actually have to do that instruction in order to get to b in order to check it. Then the check itself has to be done at runtime. And obviously, we can't add some unknown number to one virtually. We have to do it for real. So in order to do that, we actually need the one. So we load that. Then we add the int. But the frame itself has remained sort of abstract. So we can, we can pop that without doing any real work. And then the store has to do real work. And then we've ended up at the real result with only doing much less work. So we've basically reduced our 13 instructions down to five instructions in this admittedly rather contrived example. So apart from demonstrating that you can prove anything with a contrived example, we also showed that you know, there is a potential here for reducing the amount of work done considerably. So there's a couple of optimizations there, reducing memory use and uh, this optimize, how we uh, reduce the work done in the interpreter. But as I said, there's a whole bunch of aspects to the VM that we need to consider. So how do we bring all these together? Well, there's a whole bunch of techniques we can apply. Partial evaluation, compilation to machine code, commonly known as JIT compilation, specialization, which is the conversion, you know, binary op to binary op add int. Then we have memory management, the battery object layer I mentioned. Partial evaluation can also help with memory management. Then as well called unboxing, which is where you can represent like Python integer objects or Python float objects as like machine integers and floats. Then there's a cycle garbage collector. We have a better object layout will help there, but there's also something to do called incremental collection, which we, we cremate, collect some of the heap rather than trying to do the whole heap at once. And then a C extension code. We can even improve the performance of some of that by allowing C extensions to be written at a lower level interface and then removing some of the overhead of calling into or returning from the C extensions using specializing and, um, specialization and unboxing. So the really thing I wanted you to take away from that is that Python is getting faster. And we've done a fair bit, but there's plenty more to do. So we, keep, we expect it to keep getting faster. So if you're interested in helping or interested in this sort of stuff, then um, come and talk to me. But uh, I mean, the most practical thing you can do is just upgrade to the most recent version and save yourself some energy and maybe a bit of money. So uh, thank you. And one last thing I have to say is that list of benchmarks we had at the beginning, that's our data. That's what we're working with. If it doesn't represent your workload, there's a good chance we aren't going to be helping you. So give us your benchmarks. We need more benchmarks. We always need more benchmarks. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Do we have any questions? Remember, we have a microphone here in the middle of the, the corridor. So please approach and queue up in case you have more questions. Go. Thank you for your talk. My question comes from a place of ignorance. But in the beginning, you mentioned caching some lookups. If you cache everything, would it not be equivalent to not caching anything in the, if you end up caching everything? Uh, yeah, I mean. It's one of those, most caches are wrong anyway, in general, because you know, we're evaluating things. There's certain circumstances where we can be highly confident that the thing we evaluated last time is the thing we're going to get next time. And that's actually not that many things we're caching. It's just things that happen to happen a lot in code. So um, you know, if you've got a piece of code that says, like, Int, and you're expecting a string, you're, you're turning some JSON data into numbers, and you just int, open parentheses, the variable with the string in it. Now, that int is a global variable. We look it up every time. But we know with almost absolute certainty that it's going to be the, the class int. So that's the sort of thing we really want to cache. But other times, computations, yeah, there can be infinitely many. And yes, we don't want to be caching the results of computations, unless you explicitly use LRU cache then, but that's on you. OK, thanks. The person here in the front now. Thank you so much for your talk, Mark. 
Do you see any value in cheating for speed? As speed is often a matter of perception, maybe if we store the first 300 Fibonacci numbers in Python and the most prime numbers, so we win in cheating and have a better impression? Yeah, that's why I want more benchmarks, so we're not tempted to do that. We, uh, uh, we do have also a question uh, from Discord remotely. It says, are there any plans, idea to leverage type hints to speed up things by knowing type upfront? Okay, well, the problem with type hints is they are just that. It's a hint, so we have to check it. But we also already know statistically what the thing's likely to be. So the statistical information is no worse than the type hints, but it's more readily available and faster to get at. So the problem with the type hints is they're generally giving us the same information, but worse. Um, there are instances where we could use it because the type hint says that we should be confident that it's going to be that value right immediately. Whereas statistically, we want you to build up a bit of information. So it might give us a little bit of a head start in circumstances, but, but generally it's not worth the extra complexity. Thank you very much. The person in the back. Uh, are there any plans to replace the stack machine in CPython with a register machine? I think there was, was the no gill fork went in that direction or something like that? Uh, you, yeah, they did. And we actually did some experiments with that. And um, yeah, there is a speed up, but the problem is that it's only speeding up the interpreter. And if, as soon as we move into a just-in-time compiler, it doesn't help. And stack machines are very nice in terms of um, manipulating the code. So that example I had earlier where something's in inlined, the stack machine has a very nice property that the inline code has exactly the same effect as a call, um, as long as you have enough stack space. Whereas a register machine, that doesn't work. You have to rename all the registers. Thank you for the question. Here in the front. Python's uh, Zen says that there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. I don't know how many ways we have to add things now. We have to add integer, we have general add, we probably have to add strings together. So we have lots more implementations of add, which is going to add, um, add um, overhead for maintenance of CPython. So what is it that you are doing to CPython core dev maintainers? making their jobs so much harder by giving them so much more code that they have to maintain going forward? Uh, well, one argument I could come up with is that as we make Python itself faster, there's less requirement to write uh, extensions in C code. So maybe more code be written in Python. And the other thing is, of course, this is a C Python, and there's no Zen of C, so we're free to do whatever we want. <laughs> Do we have any other question? No, as you also, I don't see any, any other question on this course. So let's uh, thanks Mark again, and see you next time. Okay.